Davis. We're <laughs> delighted to have you here with us for a conversation about the text on lectionary 16 in year B for Sunday, July 18th, 2021. Uh, the Sundays and Seasons introduction begins with Mark's gospel makes clear how great is the press of the crowd with its countless needs to be met on Jesus and his disciples. Yet, in today's gospel, Jesus advises his disciples to get away and rest, to take care of themselves. Sometimes we think that when others are in great need, we shouldn't think of ourselves at all but Jesus also honors the caregiver's need. We are sent from Christ's table to care for others and for ourselves. This is the day that the Lord has made. Well, let, let us rejoice. And so we shall. So, um, yeah, we have Psalm 23, we have a little bit of Jeremiah, and then we have a little bit of Mark. And we're going to rotate around the room here and talk about each text, and we're, we'll kick it to Pastor Tanner, who has the beautiful and much beloved psalm known as Psalm 23. Yeah, hi, all. Psalm 23 is, again, our signed psalm this week. Even though there are 150 or 151 psalms, we will use Psalm 23 all the time, because why not? And it is much beloved, uh, and it always fits in well. So uh, you may think that this sounds incredibly familiar and that would be because um we literally just had psalm 23 on the fourth sunday after easter um and pastor rebecca did a really great bible study on that and so if you want to go back to april 22nd on youtube and find that bible study and listen to psalm 23 and her conversation on that i highly encourage you to do that because it was great um but uh, I'm going to read the psalm for us to begin today, um, and I'm going to read it from the NRSV because that is my <laughs> own version. Um, and that you, now you're it's all coming back to you the conversation that we had last time about the King James versus the NRSV. But this is my preferred version. So Psalm 23: The Lord is my shepherd; I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. Um, we are, we're not going to read the psalm this Sunday, is that correct? We're going to do, correct. we're going to do, um, one of my favorite hymns. It's a Marty Haugen tune, um, 780 called Shepherd Me, O God, um, which I'm sure that many of you are pretty familiar with, um, which is, it, it's literally just Psalm 23, wrapped up in a beautiful musical bow and presented to us. So you can look forward to that, um, as part of our worship this week. This is, I, I mean, at its core, just one of our greatest and most favored psalms. Um, and again, I'll encourage you to go back to April 22nd and take a listen because Pastor Rebecca brought some really cool stuff from rabbis and all kinds of other folks about um, how this is a shared favorite psalm across many uh, different religious traditions. Um, and that <laughs> we are, we are but one of many who love this psalm so much. Um, yeah, this, this psalm of David of comfort and of joy fits in so well with um, with our, our text for this week about shepherds. It comes up every time we have shepherds. Uh, it reminds us that uh, the shepherds of the people throughout the history of particularly the Hebrew scriptures were uh, known as kings. Um, the kings were called the shepherds um, and that many of those kings were uh, not so good as shepherds and the, the psalmist set up uh, the good shepherd as God over and against these uh, failed tyrannical kings who often did not follow the ways of God for the people. Um, and so our psalmist reminds us that God is the good shepherd, the one who cares for the sheep, the one who loves the people, who guides the people, who keeps them safe and protected, and that even in the midst of bad times, um, God is there and would never, ever abandon the flock. 
Um, and so I, I think that the one thing that I've been thinking about most, because I'm also preparing for Christmas in July, is this idea of God as shepherd, one who um, comes and is with the people. And when we talk about incarnate God, God who puts on flesh, um, there is uh, a book out there whose author I'm going to forget, but I'll find it and put it in the comments. And it is, um, uh, he smells like sheep. That's the, the title of the book, uh, Our God Who Smells Like Sheep. Because a shepherd is so close and so involved and so a part of the life of the flock that the shepherd smells like sheep. And that we worship this God who puts on flesh and who, in that sense, smells like sheep. Who, who is one of us, who smells like us and acts like us and talks like us and, and is so part of our community and our life and our hopes and our joys and our sorrows uh, that, that, that God is here and a part of this. And that is what makes God such a great and wonderful and good shepherd. So I'll leave it there with the psalm um, because it's, it's, there's so many random and wonderful things with it. Um, but yeah, there you go. Psalm 23. Smell I like love sheep. that. I don't think I've ever heard that he smells I, like sheep. That's I so cool. Either. And I uh, I ordered the book because I hadn't read it before, and I, it hasn't come yet. But I'm really looking forward to getting into it. So, you know, the piece that resonated with me because I'm getting, um, you know, I took a couple of days off, you know, a week or so ago, but now I'm getting ready to go on like a two week full on vacation. And so when you read it, I was like, leads me besides still waters. He restoreth my soul. And I was up at the lake for just, uh, you know, four or five days and spent time on my paddleboard and just, you know, that still water. I came back like so refreshed from that. And I think with all of the, the stress of COVID and tiny Zoom meetings for like the last, what it feels like a century when it's actually only, you know, a year and a half. It was really good to just spend time by the water, in the water, on the water. And in the Mark and text, then we hear that Jesus goes out and takes care of himself. So uh, I'll mm -hmm. talk at that after Pastor Rebecca um, leads us through Jeremiah. But I want to go back to smells like sheep first. Sure. When I was, I, had, I got to go to Israel twice, a phenomenal voyage. And I, I like taking off by myself. And I did that and I walked, women aren't supposed to, but I did. Anyway, walked um, around a hill on one of the sheep paths and came this close to a shepherd. And I'm not sure it was just sheep he smelled like, unless you count the entirety. And I thought about all of those beautiful woolly white sheep on the hillside in the pictures. That's not what it looks like or smells like. And I, it was really an interesting, he was delightful. But whoa, um, I really was attracted to or, or intrigued by smells like sheep. Underline smells. It's not the picture we always have, thanks, Tanner. <laughs> well, no, and I don't think we, we don't always employ the, all of our senses, you know. So this, <laughs> in case you didn't see worship on Sunday or weren't a part of it, if you circle back to the 11th, you'll just go to the gospel reading and you'll be slightly alarmed, but also your senses will be additionally employed. <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> thanks i love jeremiah i love the book of jeremiah and the book is really peculiar well so is jeremiah i mean he goes out and he says things that god tells him to that nobody would say in that kind of political situation he does the book is just as intriguing but in order to talk about it i have to bring up three of those terms MT, Masoretic Text, LXX, Septuagint, and the Dead Sea Scrolls. Do you know that Jeremiah is the longest book in the Old Testament other than the Book of Psalms? Also, that the Greek version, and I'll get there, is about an eighth shorter, 15% or so shorter than the Hebrew version. Back to the explaining those three terms, the Masoretic Text is the Hebrew of our Old Testament. 
we have used the Masoretic text as the accepted Old Testament Hebrew version. Nice. How do you spell it? M-A-S-O-R-E-T-I-C, Masoretic. Where does it come from? Oh, thank you. There was this group of guys, guys, um, about 600 CE, who were Hebrew scholars. Hebrew had stopped being a written language. There were no vowels in Hebrew. Nobody knew how to pronounce things. It was a dying language. So this tribe of exegetes, there we go, this tribe of good guys who love the Hebrew language, got together, inserted vowels without messing up the consonant count, because in Hebrew, every consonant counts. And you throw away a scroll if you don't have the right number. So they put the vowels above and below, they put in little song marks, they put in musical notations, save the language. Well, then the Arabs did a four or 500 years later too, but the Masoretes revived the Hebrew language, so we call it the Masoretes text, Masoretic text, okay? Group of scribes, thank you for the question. Um, Hebrew, we've only got one version, unlike the Greek where we've got all kinds of versions. And <laughs> committees decided which one was the best, that's a whole other story. Anyway, back to the <laughs> Hebrew. The first great translation was done in 250 BCE, um, before the Common Era, by those people, Jeremiah was one of them, that got hauled out of Jerusalem and hauled down to Egypt. And they went to the pharaohs and said, we can't read our language anymore. We've got to have the Hebrew translated into Greek. So the first great Hebrew translation was done 250 years before the time of Christ. And it's called the Septuagint. But the Septuagint, the Hebrew that's in back of it, doesn't match the Masoretic text. So we've always looked at the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew, as not quite as good as the Masoretes Hebrew text. Until we found the Dead Sea Scrolls. And there we found Hebrew scrolls that matched the Masoretic Hebrew really well. And other Dead Sea Scrolls that matched the Hebrew behind the Greek text, the Septuagint. So it turns out that the Greek of Jeremiah and the Greek of, um, sorry, the Hebrew translation of the Greek behind Jeremiah and the Hebrew translation behind the Masoretes doesn't match. The Greek is shorter, the Hebrew is longer. There's no significant differences, just a lot of verbiage, kind of like me, um, adding ideas to things. But I find that fascinating. We read the scriptures with the Holy Spirit. I get a little nervous when people tell me they read the literal translation or the literal scriptures and I want to say which ones you can't do it in the Greek you sure can't do it in Hebrew so that's just a little bit of background that I think you can't read Jeremiah without that because I love it we got it okay I will stop um yes. clarify what Septuagint is. is a Greek translation of a Hebrew text we thought wasn't as good as the Hebrew translation of a Hebrew text that the Masoretes had they got rid of all the extra versions, except the Dead Sea Scrolls have them. So you have the Hebrew text behind the Greek, and you've got the Hebrew text behind the Hebrew. They're different texts. Similar, very, very similar. No, no, I was getting at the word. <laughs> oh, Septuagint comes from 70. There were 70 scholars. That's a whole nother. You do, do you want me to go into that? No, I just wanted you to say what Sept meant, which was right. similar. If you want some time, I'll talk about the letter to Aristius, but that's a whole nother thing. That's where the Septuagint hey, comes from. Focus. Focus. One more piece, and then I promise to focus. <laughs> really good stuff is Jeremiah 36, 32, which has nothing to do with the reading we have today, but it has everything to do with the reading of the Bible. I'm going to read Jeremiah 36, 32. Then Jeremiah took another scroll. Oh. After King Jehoiakim ripped up Jeremiah's scroll, tossed it away and burnt it. Then Jeremiah took another scroll and gave it to the secretary Baruch, son of Neriah, who wrote on it at Jeremiah's dictation. All the words of the scroll that King Jehoiakim of Judah had burned in the fire, and many similar words were added to them. So which in the book of Jeremiah is the Hebrew behind the Greek version? Which is the Hebrew behind the Masoretic version? which was written by Baruch, which was added to later, which are the words of Jeremiah. Yeah, we read with the Holy Spirit and we trust God. So reading from Jeremiah 23, one through six plus seven and eight, because they're all in the same section. 
Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, says the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning the shepherds who shepherd my people. It is you who have scattered my flock. You've driven them away. You haven't attended to them. So I will attend to you for your evil doing, says the Lord. Then I myself will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the lands where I have driven them. I will bring them back to their fold and they shall be fruitful and multiply. I will raise up shepherds over them who will shepherd them and they shall not fear any longer or be dismayed, nor shall any be missing, says the Lord. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch and he shall reign as king and deal wisely and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his day, Judah will be saved and Israel will live in safety. And this is the name by which he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. That's two of three prophecies. The third follows closely after. Therefore, thus the days are surely coming, says the Lord, when it shall no longer be said, as the Lord lives who brought up the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt, but as the Lord lives who brought out and led the offspring of the house of Israel out to the land of the north, out of all lands he had driven them, and they shall live in their own land. These three prophecies are tucked together in the Hebrew text and in the English, even though ours stopped short with the, um, he shall be called the branch of righteousness. The Lord is our righteousness. As Tanner already explained, kings were called shepherds. And this just wasn't in Israel. This was in Egypt. This was in Babylon. Uh, this was in the land of the Hittites. Kings are considered shepherds of the people. There next to the Parthenon in Greek is a king, a lad, carrying a sheep over his shoulder. Kings are shepherds of their people. And Israel had a whole bunch of bad ones. And so the destruction coming on them is due to those bad ones. First in Israel, then in Judah. Okay. Um, when Jehoiakim was king, it was the history of the false worship, the false prophets, the false priest that brought them to the point where Assyria in the northern kingdom now, well, they wiped out almost all of the southern except Jerusalem. Now it's going to hit Jerusalem also. So the first wave, Jehoiakim dies in 598. The first wave, as Tanner has told us, was 597. Ezekiel went. We've already told that story. Um, but God here is promising that God will bring those people back. The... Ten northern tribes of Israel were scattered among the Assyrians and became Assyrian. The others went to Babylon, and there they got to stay. Many of the ten tribes came down to Babylon and can still claim their heritage. When they went to, I mean, to Jerusalem, and then they were exiled to Babylon, they have the books, they have the scrolls, they have their heritage. And they were allowed to stay in groups so they could continue to worship the Lord their God, not the ten northern. So the Lord will be called, um, the Lord is our righteousness. We go immediately to Jesus the Christ. But the Jews who heard this are looking for the hope that will regather the people from all the lands where they have been scattered. And this is, I'm so sorry, one more, the diaspora, the separating of the people. The ones who went to Assyria first exile are Assyrian. The ones who went down to Jerusalem were allowed to stay together in Babylon. But Jeremiah, who wanted to stay, was hauled off by Johanan to Egypt, which is eventually where we're going to get the plea for the Hebrew scriptures to be translated into Greek. That's what we call the diaspora. And I think the last of the three prophecies is critical because it says, no more will the Lord be known as the one who brought us out of Egypt with a strong arm and a mighty hand. That's quoted constantly in the Old Testament until this time. But now... The Lord will be known as the Lord lives who brought out and led the offspring of the house of Egypt of Israel out of the land of the north and out of all lands where he had driven them. And they will live in their own land. There have been partial fulfillments of that prophecy as the Lord is our righteousness. At the time when um, the Persians allowed, um, Cyrus allowed the Jews to come back to Israel. Again, of course, they were driven out in 70 CE and 135 with the destruction of the second temple. And they came back in 148 when Israel was made a country. But what the final fulfilling of that prophecy will be is in God's hands and the future that we cannot yet see. 
But I love the three prophecies together because the hope is not just for one time or one exile, but the hope is there for all time and all people. God will gather the people. Well, I feel like I'm back in seminary. Sorry. No, Does not, I don't want to apologize. I seriously feel like I'm back in seminary. That was that was great. Okay. Uh, and slightly overwhelming, but in a good way. I love this stuff. Uh, we can tell. <laughs> All right. Moving on to the gospel according to St. Mark, chapter 6. We have sort of a two-piece section here. So as you turn to your Bibles, you'll notice... It is 30 to 34, and then it skips all the way over uh, to 53 through 56. The Sundays in Season preface reads, When Jesus sends his disciples out to teach and heal, they minister among large numbers of people. Their work is motivated by Christ's desire to be among those in need. The text reads, the apostles gathered around Jesus and told them, told him all that they had done and taught. And he said to them, come away to a deserted place all by yourselves and rest for a while. For many were coming and going and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in the boat to a deserted place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized him, them and hurried there on foot from all the towns and arrived ahead of them. As he went ashore, he saw a great crowd and he had compassion for them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. When they had crossed over, they came to the land uh, at Gennesaret and moored the boat. When they got out of the boat, people at once recognized him and rushed out about that whole region and began to bring the sick on mats to wherever they heard he was and wherever he went into the villages or cities or farms, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and begged him that they might touch even the fringe of his cloak and all who touched it were healed. Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Yeah, I, um, I didn't have a whole lot of time to prep for this one um, because I think I was sort of spending time in my head with he leads me beside still waters and the importance of rest. Um, so I had a couple of thoughts. Uh, let me see here. I got to pull it up. Um, first of all, we have this absolutely wonderful section of, uh, uh, it's called Richard Rohr's Daily Meditation. And this week he was talking, it's from the Center for Action and Contemplation. And he has this week 25, the doorways to Christian contemplation. And it talks about present, open, and awake. And he was talking about James Finley, who is a true contemplative. And talks about the importance of meditation and I think that that's where we need to go when we're feeling exhausted and need to fill up our compassion bucket. Um, there's actually a brand new book called Fierce Compassion that just came out. Um, I can see it sitting over in the living room uh, but I highly recommend that. It's by Kristen Neff and most of the times when we find ourselves in trouble, it's because we have broken boundaries or because we're over-functioning or because we're exhausted and we're not taking care of ourselves. So this idea of Jesus finding a quiet place to rest is uh, really great, especially on, on, on my timeline where the next day I'm going to be gone for a couple of weeks. But I wanted to just do a segue here and remind people that there's no, um, there's no prescription for how to meditate. But I'm going to roll you through just one brief meditation exercise because I thought it would be kind of an interesting space to go. So 
Tanner and, and Rebecca, if you want to turn off your camera, you can, or you can just like kick back and, and relax and, and listen to the, the words that I'm going to read here from Richard Rohr. He writes, there's no single way to meditate. There are, however, certain acts and attitudes inherently endowed with the capacity to awaken sustained states of meditative awareness. So if you're willing to do this with me, and I hope you all are on the Zoom, but if you're driving, listening to this on a podcast, don't do it <clears throat> or pull over on the side of the road. Okay, there is the text. With respect to the body, sit still, sit straight, Place your hands in a comfortable or meaningful position in your lap. Close your eyes or lower them toward the ground. Breathe slowly and naturally. With respect to your mind, be present, open, and awake, neither clinging to nor rejecting anything. And with respect to attitude, maintain non-judgmental compassion toward yourself as you discover yourself clinging to and rejecting everything and non-judgmental compassion towards others. Go to your place of meditation. You might say a brief and simple prayer expressing your gratitude to God for having been led to a path of meditation and asking for the wisdom and courage and strength to be faithful to it. All right, come on back. That was just one of the pieces that I was thinking of, you know, what does it mean to find a quiet space and just rest? And I have found like my go-to thing has been mindfulness and meditation, uh, especially during such a bizarre couple of years here. What's important to note is, as far as the mark and text go is that the book ends again, right? Because we have this we don't get the whole picture here. We get these two separate pieces of scripture. Um, this last Sunday, we talked about the beheading of John the Baptist. And then it moves around this. It moves into this story. Um, Jesus has this great compassion for them because they are like sheep without a shepherd. And then we have it stops. And it's the story of the feeding of the 5,000. And it's the 5,000 men. So that's not counting women and children, <laughs> which is also a title for a book um, by Megan McKenna, I think, called Not Counting Women and Children. I might be wrong with the author's name on that right now, but this is the story of the loaves and fishes, five and two fish, remember? And then you get that wonderful reminder of how many they had gathered up after, and there were 12 baskets. So a few weeks ago, I had the call and response and worship for the number 12, and we talked about 12 being a significant number. Um, so the point I think that I'm taking from this is that when we... Uh, when we take care of other people, we get tired. It is important to take care of ourselves. Brene Brown says that there is no such thing as compassion fatigue. That is, compassion fatigue is not a real thing because it's someone who has bad boundaries and doesn't take care of themselves. <laughs> I don't know if I completely agree with that because I think we all have moments of feeling fatigued when we're trying to be compassionate all the time, but I'm going to be talking about this idea of self-compassion, fierce self-compassion, using Christine Neff's work um, and trying to apply it somehow in worship. I don't know what that's going to look like yet, but I have a concluding song for our time today, and it is from Sam Baker, and I just think it's kind of fun to do random things. Go in peace. Go in kindness. Go in love. Go in faith. Leave the day. Day behind us. Day is gone. Go in grace. 
Let us go into the dark, not afraid, not alone. Let us hope by some good pleasure safely to arrive at home. Let us hope by some good pleasure safely to arrive at home. That's a song by Sam Baker. And it's one of my favorite songs uh, because it reminds us to go in peace, go in kindness, go in love, go in faith. That's all I have for today. Announcements. We have Jazz in July coming up. Um, wow. So this last Sunday, we had well over 100 people. And it was a Travis trio, and it was amazing. And we're raising money for Habitat, and we are partnering with many of our community partners, uh, whether it's Presbyterian Homes or uh, I'll have Tanner Reddell off the list because I don't remember all of them off the top of my head. Yeah, all of our community partners are invited to come and, and participate in these events. Last night, or the other night, we had uh, Pres Homes, and then we also had um, Basic Needs Thrift Shop and also uh, the folks that, that run our drop-in center here at the church, which is St. Croix Family Resource Center, which is going to become uh, the Connect uh, group here pretty soon. So maybe by next week even, they will be the Connect group. Um, and so they, along with a few other folks, will be joining us over the next couple of weeks. So if you come out for Jazz in July, which you should, make sure you swing by and say hi to those groups and learn a little bit about what they're up to in the community and how we can continue to be good partners with them as well. Right on. And then at the end of the month, on the last Sunday of the month, we have um, a bunch of food trucks coming around five o'clock and they'll be from, I think it's the egg roll food truck and hy V and uh, I don't know, there's going to be trucks, uh, fire trucks and schoolie bus and we are raising money for South Washington County Cares as well as Habitat for Humanity. So please, please, please join us for those events. And if you cannot join us for those events or you need a ride to those events, you just need to let us know and we'll see what we can do to arrange some help for you. Otherwise, keep joining us for worship on Sundays at nine o'clock, either live stream or in person or follow it up on YouTube or Facebook because it'll be in the cloud forever. Go in peace, go in love, go in grace. Leave the day, day behind us, day is done. Go in peace. Thanks everyone. Bye.